Hello, I'm John Shepherd, and in this short video I'm going to answer some questions that have been sent in to the YouTube channel and they all pertain to speed. The first question comes in from Silas MN and he's a triple jumper and he asks whether he should be doing speed endurance work and whether or not it's too taxing for triple jumpers. This is quite a difficult question to answer not knowing exactly what his speed endurance sessions are. However, what I will say is look at the triple jump and the long jump events. They require energy to be released for about four seconds, i.e. from the start of your run up to the time you complete your jump. Therefore, if you're running over four seconds, then you are training speed endurance. You're developing your short term anaerobic energy system rather than the immediate one. And although you're giving yourself a background in fitness that will help in general, it's not so specific to the type of speed that you need on the run up. I've found through the experiences of my training group that the athletes just need to be fit enough to handle, let's say, 8 to 10 40 meter efforts within the realms of a competition environment. So you've got your warm up run throughs and you've got some sprints in your warm up as well and then you've got your six full out efforts in the competition. Therefore I train the guys in the group to be able to handle that load and that amount of speed and that intensity of speed as well. So what does this mean in reality? Well, basically it means that most of our sprints are undertaken up to a distance of 60 meters. And we'll do a lot of work around the 30 to 40 meter distance. And this also includes run-ups. So do take a look at some of the run-up videos that I've done and you'll see the specific work that we do on this aspect, which is of course crucial. There is a difference between sprinting and run-up sprinting but I won't go into that now as we're looking at speed endurance. When you use the short term, immediate anaerobic energy system, your body uses stored phosphates, chemicals, and there's an explosion of these when you create the energy needed to sprint. After the sprint, these need to be replenished. Now you're not gonna go into oxygen debt as you would do if you're performing, for example, 200s with a very short recovery. However, you do need to take a full recovery between each flat out short effort, i.e. under about 40 meters in distance. So I recommend about two to three to four minutes between each sprint in order to let the chemicals replenish in your muscles and also so that you begin to get the body used to taking a break and going again, which is exactly what you need to do in a competition. Now, having said all that, I'm not against some form of speed endurance training or tempo runs as well. Particularly at the onset of training, when you don't want to go flat out every session, you're going to need to put in some technical work, some technical running work to improve your running mechanics and also to develop some form of fitness, some base fitness. Now a lot of that will depend on your training maturity and as to how much training you've already done and how fit, specifically fit you are. My guys will start off with some tempo runs and we may be doing some 120s closer to the indoor season and the outdoor season. But very rarely do we go beyond 120 and these distances are covered very infrequently in training. Probably on average once every three weeks across the whole training year. In terms of conditioning your mind and body for the type of sprinting that you need for the long and triple jump and one that will develop more energy capacity and the ability to create more speed we do broken runs so for example 20 flat out 20 meters relax only down to about 95 percent and then 20 flat out again and there's a very very tough version of this and this requires you to sprint flat out for 30 meters switch off for 10 meters and then sprint again for a further 10 meters it's not really possible to hit a greater velocity on the 10 meter burst, i.e. from 40 to 50 meters. However, it's the intent to do it that really counts. And the same also goes for bursts over 40 to 60 meters, whereby you sprint, try and go a little bit faster for four or five strides, relax for four or five strides, but only slightly again, sprint flat out again for four to five strides, relax four to five, sprint four to five, it's the will, the intent to move your limbs quicker and I believe will generate more potentiality to develop greater speed.
The next question is from Anaf Shakrina and he also asks about speed and specifically the use of wicket drills for run-up practice and also what are the best ways to develop maximum velocity. I'll deal with the second part of the question first, i.e. developing maximum velocity as in a way some of my answers to the first question reflect the answers that I'm going to give for the second. Basically, to develop maximum velocity, somewhat obviously, you've got to be moving at max velocity. Therefore, if you're training at 90% of maximum speed, even 95%, you're not training at maximum velocity. Therefore, you need to be fully committed to the sprinting efforts that you're performing. And to do this, it's often better to use a shorter distance rather than say 60 meters, particularly if you're a long jumper or a triple jumper. So a great workout that we will do is flying 20 meters and flying 10 meter segments with a long enough run on to enable the jumper to be at maximum velocity for those 10 meters or 20 meter segments. And the idea is to maintain long jump, triple jump running posture, but really hit that section and move as fast as you can through it. Now the answer about wicket drills or low hurdles as we call them in the UK. It's difficult to position them in the right place in order to get the patterning needed for the run-up. However, I have experimented a few times and used a few wickets, four or five, to generate greater cadence coming into the takeoff, but not using the athlete's actual run-up. They begin to increase their speed, so they're up to about 90% and they enter the wicket section and speed up with the turnover that the wickets create, but then run out of the wicket section and affect a takeoff. I found that this can help with posture and with getting a greater feeling of how to attack into the board. However, I think the benefit of wickets is more to be done away from the run-up and in terms of creating the correct postures needed for sprinting. So using a run-on and having the wickets laid out over about 20 to 30 meters for example is a good way to develop increased sprinting capacity. I will add to this that acceleration is crucial to maximum velocity. If you can accelerate quickly and effectively, then you're going to push your maximum velocity phase up higher. So this year in particular with the jumpers, we spent a lot more time developing more effective accelerative mechanisms. And using the free lap system has enabled me to time these more effectively. And I've seen a tenth to two tenths of a second improvement and for some of the group over 20 meters from when we started back training in October and it seems that this is increasing their ability to hit maximum velocity and increase maximum velocity. And the final question on this speed topic Q&A comes from Nathan Devitz and he asks about whether or not he should do his weight training after uh, competition on a Saturday, so to do his weights on a Sunday. Now you might initially think, what's this got to do with speed? Well, in my response to him on the YouTube channel in the comments section, I actually indicated that some athletes weight train in the day before a competition or even in the hours preceding a competition due to what they believe will give them a potentiating performance boosting effect. And I've known about this for about the last two decades. It's believed that if you use a high intensity, low volume session, that you can create a stimulus to your nervous system, which will enable you to generate more power, more speed in a forthcoming competition or indeed training session later on in the day. Now in the session that you do perform, if you try it, you only need to do one or two lifts, two or three sets or three to four reps but around about 85-95% maximum of your one repetition maximum. The idea is to go in, do a quick 20 minute workout, that's all, plenty of recovery. Really put effort into those lifts and the idea is by doing this you will have primed your nervous system, your muscles and your ability to recruit muscle fibre in order to generate greater power and speed capability. Now if you are going to try this I suggest that you do it in training first. I found that some people will respond to that type of training, potentiating training as it's called, whilst others don't, but it's certainly worth having a go. I answered that question this way because I wouldn't advise doing your weight training after a competition because competitions take it out of you. 
and then to go into the weights room the day after a competition and potentially lift heavy and put 100% effort in again means that your central nervous system is going to get a double hit and potentially you're going to increase fatigue, neural fatigue as well as phys physical fatigue. Rather, I do some active recovery and let your body regenerate and your mind of course regenerate and get yourself ready for the next training sessions and importantly, the next cycle into the next set of competitions. It's mid-January in the UK at the moment at the time of making this video and my training group is about to start competing to a serious level. We've got the British trials coming up in the early part of February where four of them are going to be competing and I'll be taking you along on the journey to see how they do. First competition starts this weekend so do look out for some updates on the YouTube channel and also on the Instagram channel. And of course if you're competing, good luck and hopefully there's going to be plenty of PBs to come.